Oops. Yeah, so uh, let's see. I'll introduce Nathaniel real quick uh, while he's getting plugged in there. Uh, yeah, Nathaniel, like he said, he works at Berkeley. Uh, he works on NumPy. He recently became a Python core developer. Um, basically, he's omnipresent, and you cannot escape him. He will innovate <laughs> uh, to the extreme. Um, tonight, he's actually not. He's a he's a NumPy maintainer, and he works on all this really cool stuff. But tonight, he's going to talk to us about uh, asynchronous input output the expanded form of I.O., async I.O., but it's not async I.O., the library. It is a library of his own fashion called Trio that has informed much of his uh, asynchronous doctrine. I'm just using longer and longer words. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so, but, uh, yeah, so we've actually, because he is such an expert in the field and so forth, we're going to give him an extra 10, 15 minutes or so because he's going to give us a master class, but it's going to basically start at a more beginner level, I believe. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, so, for, it's for yeah. mere mortals. That's so. the idea, yeah. Right. Can you all hear me? Is the mic working and everything? People yeah, in the back good. are happy. All right. So, yeah, so thanks for that introduction. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be talking about concurrency, the art of writing programs that can do more than one thing at once, right? Um, so in Python, you know, it's it's easy to write programs to do things in sequence, right? So if you want to write a program that walks for a while and then chews gum for a while, as sort of indicated in this diagram, you just you know write walk, you call walk, and then you call chew gum later, and that's what it does. Uh, but sometimes you might want to write code that does both at the same time for a while. Um, it's not quite so clear how to do that. What does that code look like? But it's very useful. This comes up all over the place, right? So if you have a web server. Um, like some request comes in, you got to do some processing, send a response back, all that. But while you're doing that, oops, someone wants to start a WebSocket connection, and then another request comes in, and some more. You got to handle all these things at the same time, right? Or if you're writing a web spider, say you're fetching a bunch of web pages, it's a lot more efficient if you can do that several, uh, you know, loops of that in parallel, so that you know you can speed things up, right? Or even just very simple things, like say you have a simple proxy, like. Um, you know, you're trying to send messages to her, but I'm in, in between. I'm acting as a broker, so I want to have one loop reading stuff from you and sending it to you, another loop reading stuff from you and sending it to you, and I want to run both those loops at the same time, right? Um, so that's really cool. Concurrency is really, it's all over the place, super useful, but there is a problem. Google, what's the problem with concurrent programming? Um, it's really hard. <laughs> Um, so, like, how hard? Let's let's dig down into one example. It's a relatively simple thing. It's a real thing, and we'll see what real implementations look like. So, say you wanted to go visit my blog. So you type the URL into your browser's bar, and you hit enter. And then the browser does a whole ton of things. But the very first thing it has to do before it can get to all that clever HTTP and HTML and all that stuff is it just has to make a connection to that server. So pull out that host name and make a connection. Now, when you want to connect to a host, it's like when you're calling someone on the phone, the first thing you have to do is look up their phone number. right? You, that's what you actually have to call. Same thing for hosts. You can't just connect to the host name. You need to first find the IP address. Um, why does alt tab? There we go. So, and in Python, this is conveniently provided for us in the socket module. Socket is just where they stick all the low-level networking stuff. You can say, OK, I want to connect to Vorbis.org, HTTPS, get adder info. Can you tell me how to do that? and it returns this little pile of gobbledygook. So the first three are some magic numbers that let us sort of configure our connection. And then there's an empty string for no particular reason. Um, and then at the end is the thing we have to connect to after we're configured. So that's pretty simple, right? You want to connect, go to my blog, it, your browser does something like that, makes a connection, all the other magic happens. But sometimes something more complicated happens. Like say we're going to Facebook, right? Now, oh, so actually, it's actually giving us two options here. So we can either configure like this and then use this address. Someone's been having a bit of fun here. Um, or we could configure like this and use this address. And the reason they have both of those is because for some people, only one of those will work. But we don't know which one is going to work. So what, we have to have some kind of strategy for dealing with this, right? And it's, not, it's more complicated than just like A or B, right? So sometimes we have, so here's Debian, gives us seven options. You know, <laughs> they're covering all their bases, right? So what are we going to do? Um, there's a few different strategies we could do to handle all these different um, connection things. So one is you just go through them one at a time, 
right? So you try the first one, and then you wait, and OK, that one failed. Let's try the second one. That one failed. Third one. Great, that one worked. Stop there. We can move on. Problem with that is it can be really slow. So in particular, like a successful connection will often take a few hundred milliseconds. Well, this one where you have to wait for it to time out might be like 30 seconds. So because we started with this one instead of this one, we made it like 100 times slower. That's kind of unfortunate. Is there any way we can avoid that? Well, so one thing you might say is, well, we don't know which one to start with. We really want to start with the right one. So we'll start with all of them, right? Just do it in parallel in a race. Um, that's really fast. You will, you know, and so right. And then you, you just start them all. As soon as one succeeds, throw away the rest, right? That's really fast. It's also pretty inefficient, right? It's putting a lot of stress on the network, on the server. There's actually an RFC saying, don't do this, right? <laughs> so is there any way we can kind of like get like a Goldilocks solution and say you know, the, in the best of both worlds, right? And that's this thing called happy eyeballs. It makes web pages load faster, so your eyeballs are happy. I don't know. I didn't make up the name. I apologize. But the way it works is it's sort of a combination of those two strategies, right? So you start out, you just make one connection attempt. But then you also you start this timer, and after a little while, you say, hey, it's still going. I'm getting bored. I'm going to kick off another attempt. Whereas if one fails, you can just kick off the next one immediately. And then eventually, as soon as one succeeds, you kill the rest, right? So this is almost as efficient as the sequential version, because most of the time, that first one succeeds before you do anything else. But it's almost as fast as the race one, because you don't wait 30 seconds. You only wait like a few hundred milliseconds, right? So it really is both those things. And what I like about this example is this is Relatively simple, right? I think you could all understand that. A few sentences of explanation. It's a nice picture. It fits on a slide. It's also a real thing. So we can look at, like, it's not some straw man I made up. We can look at how real projects implement this and see what kind of hoops you have to jump through. So first of all, we can look at async IO, which is you know the new standard for asynchronous IO in Python 3. Um, so I went to look at their implementation. Uh, here's an open issue on the async IO tracker uh, filed in four years ago. Um, they're working on it any, any year now. OK, so that's funny. Um, how about Twisted? Twisted has everything. So um, and it turns out they do have an implementation made by uh, this uh, brilliant person. It looks like this. So that this is all one function, which isn't so bad. It's also a completely impossible to understand chain, like callback chain stuff. It's about 120 lines long. I've highlighted all the defs. So, this is a, there's a little embedded class here. Um, and down here, we have a function inside a function inside a function inside a function. So, right, like, now this works. This is not like, I'm not like saying, oh, this is terrible code. Or isn't, you know, let's laugh at them, right? Like, I couldn't write this. <laughs> right? I, think, I think of this like you hear those stories from the old days about, oh, yeah, you implemented an assembly, you know, a whole operating system and a word processor and assembler, and it takes three kilobytes. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. I hope I never have to maintain it, right? <laughs> That's this kind of thing. Um, so uh, Glyph, the founder of Twisted, I think this has been bugging him, basically. Like a lot of people looked at that, tried to figure out, it's like, there's got to be a better way. And for like the last like four years, he's been like, God, there must be a better way. He's come up with a better solution. Um, it looks like this. <laughs> it's 600 lines long. Um, but to help you understand if there's a nice diagram to show the control flow. <laughs> yeah, he is, yeah, he wrote a library called Automat so that he could, I mean. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, that said, that code I just showed you has a bug in it where sometimes it just sits there doing nothing for a while, which I pointed out to them as part of putting this together. Did I mention concurrent programming is hard, right? We have this algorithm that looks straightforward enough, but once you get into all like the air handling details and what if someone starts making a connection and decides to cancel it and how do you unwind, well, that's, it just becomes a nightmare, right? Um, and fortunately, we have some of these heroic folks who are, you know, will figure out how to do it. But that's not, that's not all of us. Um, I don't want to have to do that. That's why I use Python, right? Like, does everyone remember back when Randall Monroe discovered Python? And that's some hair flying. How? Python! I learned it last night. <laughs> now I can fly, right? And it's silly, but haven't we all had that feeling, right? It's just th things are so simple, right? That, or if you use some other language, especially lower level stuff like C, where, yeah, it does take you 600 lines to put on your shoelaces. I use Python, so I don't, because I don't want to do that. So this brings us to 
my new thing. I want to, you know, I'm advertising tonight, right? Just called Trio. It's a new um, li um, library for doing concurrency in Python 3.5 plus, all major platforms, you just pip install, it's the usual thing. And basically what happened here is I was like, this is horrible and we have these nice new capabilities in the interpreter. Is there anything we can do about this to make it nicer? Went and studied how uh, these other libraries worked and kind of what are the places that make it so hard? See, can I come up with some principles to make it better? And I like what it came up with. I mean, basically that's the goal, right? So can we, can we make something that's like the, feels like Python and make concurrency a, a kind of problem that you know, is not not so complicated? So I'm gonna show you a simple example first um, and we'll walk through it to sort of show you how the different pieces of Trio work how they fit together, and then we're gonna implement happy eyeballs. So you be ready for me to be typing for a while, 600 lines, yeah. It'll be a little quicker than that. <laughs> so here's the example we'll start with. It's just a simple proxy, like I mentioned in that example earlier. Um, it'll be all, what? That keep doing that, okay. So what this does, like there's a lot of details here that we'll go over in a moment, so don't try to understand it all, but basically, we have our main function here, which is gonna open two connections to little servers on localhost, and then it's gonna copy, just copy data between them by calling this proxy two-way function, which calls two copies of proxy one-way, which is just a usual, sort of the obvious loop. While true, read from the source, send to the sync, right? And if you run out of data, then stop. Just to show you what that looks like. Um, so here, I'm just gonna, in these two terminals here, I'm gonna start two little servers, and then I'm gonna run that code here, and now you see if I type in here, it shows up the other side, and vice versa, right? And then if I close one, notice I killed this one on the right, the other one exited, and it said all done over here. So that's sort of nice shutdown behavior. Now it's, well, let's walk through this so you can understand what just happened. Basically, overall, there's three things I'm gonna tell you about. I assume you already know regular Python, and then Trio has these IO routines it provides, but they're all kind of the obvious thing. There's these three new things that are kind of weird and exotic that I want to teach you about. So first, a async await. Uh, basically this is, you know, you see the, that one-way proxy. This is relatively simple, right? Like I said, just a loop, read, send. This would look totally normal and, you know, everything, except it's got these funny await and async words thrown in. What's going on with that, right? So before, we can explain the, the new keywords. Let's talk about what async concurrency means. Like, what, why is this a thing at all? There's basically two ways, basic approaches to concurrency. So one is preemptive. The idea is you write code, and most of the time you're kind of in this, well, okay, one more backing up. One of the big challenges in writing concurrent code is that you've got two things running at the same time and they can like stomp on each other. Like one's trying to work with the data structure and the other starts working with it too, and they don't know about each other and all kinds of horrible things happen, and shrapnel everywhere, and you know, it's bad. So in preemptive concurrency approaches, by default, you're kind of in this unsafe world where other stuff can happen. And then you have to go through and you have to mark the piece of places in your code where you say, okay, here's something sensitive, complicated is going on. Please make sure no one else stomps on me here. And so the way this is executed, okay, so the scheduler's made sure, okay, these two places that are marked in blue, they don't overlap with each other. But otherwise, things can happen willy-nilly. The other approach is cooperative concurrency, or which is also known as async concurrency. It's kind of a silly name, but we're stuck with it. And the idea here is that by default, you're in the safe mode, and then you have to opt in to the dangerous mode by marking the places where you allow other things to run. So this sort of gets executed like this, where each of those red points we get broken up and let something else run, right? But there's never two things running at the same time. It makes it a lot easier to avoid those problems. This is just way easier to use, because you know you can, humanly fathom, like you can look through the code and see where are the possible problem places. Over here, like no one can possibly understand it. People still use this because it's faster, as you can see, right? It can run through the code. This had, you know, split things up over more space. However, that's if you don't have a gil. And of course, in Python, we do have a gil. Why do we have a gil? Well, it's because the Python interpreter developers were like, this is too hard, we want to work in this mode. That's what the gil does, is implements cooperative concurrency, but only for the interpreter. Right, so the, like those greedy Python core developers, like me, up now apparently, um, <laughs> are making us all pay the cost of the gill, but we're not getting the benefits of it, right? So it's time to take back the gill, right? That's what the idea of async concurrency, right? You know, give it some, we're paying the cost of this anyway, it's kind of a no-brainer, we should be using this kind of model. But what that means is, when we write our code, we need to have some way to mark where are these places where weird things can happen, right? 
And so that's what these awaits are. It's just, it's just this bookkeeping mechanism so you can keep track. Okay, when I, this is a function that might reschedule, right? And so there's a few simple rules. I can demonstrate if alt tab will work. There we go. Um, so like trio.sleep is, you know, it does the obvious thing, it sleeps for a little while. And it's one of these special functions. It's, it's called an async function. It's just like a regular function, except that it has the special, you know, it could do something weird, could happen there. So we want to mark all the calls to it. So you can't just call it like that. You have to write await trio.sleep. It's just like calling a function, except you stick an await in. However, there's a problem. If we just try doing that, Python says, no, you can't, you can't do that here. You have to put it inside a function. Say, so, okay, well, let's try, you know, await sleep. We can do sleep one function. Um, and it's tired, and then it goes to sleep, and then wakes up, right? Let's try that. Oh, no, Python's still cranky at us. It says, no, it has to be an async function. And so what this is doing is, now, if our function's going to call this thing that we're, something weird could happen, that means that all our callers also need to be warned that when they call us, something weird can happen, right? So that's Python helping us keep track of that. Right? So what we have to do to solve this, we just have to say, okay, now this is an async function. And then now if we want to call it, I don't know, we make another function called sleep twice. Now we use await on that. And that's how it works, right? And that's all, Python's happy about this. Now you might have a question, which is, okay, so anytime I call this, I have to mark it async. And then anything that calls this has to be async and so on. How do I start the whole, like how do I call an async function in the first place, right? Um, and there's a very simple answer. That's what that trio.run thing uh, does. You see up above here and also down here. So it's going to sleep and then it does it again, right? Now you understand async await, right? It's not that complicated, actually. Um, one more little note. Um, you saw this async with, for a, so A and B are our two connections. You're probably familiar with using with to like make sure you close files and network resources and stuff like that. This is just like that. Except now we have two kinds of functions. We have the regular ones and the async ones that need to have the special marking. And what does a with block does? It calls some code at the beginning and end of the block. And so an async with calls some code at the beginning of the block, but that code's allowed to be async. Right? So it doesn't await call at the beginning and end of the block. That's all there is to it. Right? There's also async for, which is the same, except each time it goes to fetch the next thing in the iteration, that's allowed to be an async code. Pretty straightforward. OK. so. I was telling you about async await. Hopefully, we all get that now. That's kind of the basic bookkeeping mechanism we use to keep track of where can this weird thing about scheduling happen. It also has another use in cancellation in Trio. It also marks where things can be canceled. So you notice I had this um, move on after, this 10 second time limit in there. Maybe you didn't and went by too fast. We didn't actually hit that time limit when I showed you the example the first time, because uh, I you know, killed it first. We started again. Da, da, da. So, OK, we see it's running, right? But now if we sort of just hang around and wait for a moment, then we look down here in a moment. Any second now, there it goes. Right, it just got tired. <laughs> it's that 10 second timer had expired. And it killed it. Notice both connections closed and everything, right? And so the way that works is just, yeah, that put a 10 second timeout on whatever happens inside there. After 10 seconds, it'll get stopped. Um, how do I have this? Right. And the, how does that work? How does this magic happen? It's actually pretty straightforward. It's just this conspiracy between all the other parts of Trio to make that happen. So if you have the, so when you're, what's hap what happened there is, you know, both of those loops were sitting in this receipts and they're waiting for data to arrive. And then the timeout expired. And internally, Trio was keeping track of that and said, oh, hey, and so these are, you know, Trio methods it provides, they're set up, to, hooked into them. They say, oh, 10 seconds happened. And they raised this special Trio.canceled exception. And the exception, you know, bubbles out, bubbles out, bubbles out, and hits this with. While it passes through here, it kills the with thing, so the sockets got closed. So we saw the, the two programs shut down. They're like, oops, I, my connection got closed. And then on the way out, eventually it gets caught here, right? And then, so then our program continues on merrily because, you know, we've successfully unwound that stuck that had to be canceled. And these can be, uh, a nice thing is these can be nested so that this canceled exception has a little magic marker on it so that it knows which block it belongs to. It will go to the right spot. And basically, that's all there is to it. Um, oh, yeah, there is one little set of extra details. Um, you could also, uh, say, write something like this and pull out this cancel scope object. That gives you a little more flexibility if you want it. So for example, 
It has a deadline attribute. You can see what is the, when is this cancel going to expire. You can change it. See, I need a little more time. You can add some to it. You can also cancel it right now. Just be like, done. I'm just, that's enough. Think of that like when someone hits stop in the web browser. Like it's like, oh, well, I was in the middle of doing all this network stuff, but actually, forget that. That's that's kind of what this cancel method is for. And then you can like introspect the cancellation some more. And there's if you don't want to just like keep going after a cancel, you can also have like fail after, which raises an exception. Or if you want to set an absolute deadline instead of 30 seconds from now and say at this time, you can do that. All the usual bells and whistles. That's the basic idea. OK, so now we understand cancel scopes, hopefully. And finally, nurseries, the last piece of trio. Um, this is sort of where the magic concurrency part happens. It better be, right? I told you the concurrency library, and I'm almost done describing it, and I haven't told you about concurrency. So this is a little bit weird. This is sort of the heart of Trio's ideas, actually. So this is our thing, our two-way proxy. The way it works is it calls two copies of the one-way proxy function at the same time, right? So you get those two loops going at once. It has this sort of funny thing it does. So it says async with trio.open nursery as nursery. So it has, creates this with block, and it gets, pulls out this object that's like attached to it. And then it says, in that nursery, start these two tasks. So the idea here is, in, in a lot of frameworks, if you want to spawn a child task, you can just do that. Just throw new children out into the void, and they'll run. And if something happens to them, oh well, like maybe we'll print something to the console, but no one notices otherwise, right? In Trio, we think, you know, like if you're going to spawn a child, you need to take a little more responsibility for it, <laughs> right? So at least, like you know, like a nursery is a place where you keep children. To like keep that right, yeah, you see, okay. Um, so yeah, so if you want to spawn a child in, nurse, in Trio, the first thing you have to do is make a nursery, and then the idea is that the children are bound to this sort of parent frame. So here's conceptually what happens when we execute code like this. So we we open our nursery, and then we call we have you know the block the code inside that nursery starts ex sorry inside that with block starts executing right, and that first line runs it calls the start soon method. What that does is, you know, now we, it starts a copy of that loop. But conceptually, what it is is it's running inside that with block, basically, concurrently to the first one, right? And then we execute that second line. It starts another one of those, right? And then this part finishes, but the with block's not done yet, right? The with block doesn't return until everything inside it has finished, right? And so that's how we're able to get that nice sort of cleanup behavior here, right? From the caller's perspective, proxy two-way is just a regular function you call. It does something for a while. It stops. There's no thing, nothing like, oh, it spawned some things, so it returned, but it's actually still going in the background. It's, it hasn't actually happened yet, any of that. right? It's just it runs. When, and when it's done running, it's finished. Everything's cleaned up. We know no one's using those uh, streams anymore, so the width block around it, it's safe to close them. It just provides some sort of basic hygiene. right? The other thing it does is that it gives us this exception handling. right? So, Here's how, suppose that something went wrong inside this loop. Like, you know, I had a typo in the simplest case, or it, um, there was a network error, or just, you know, there was the cancel, cancellation exception, whatever. So if there's an exception, well, so first of all, there's the normal Python sort of stack unwinding thing. It'll run any accept blocks, all that. Maybe you catch it, but let's assume you don't. And eventually it hits the top of that part, and so now it's hitting this, you know, async with nursery. At that point, we want to keep unwinding the stack. But there's this other stuff running in that nursery. And remember, we can't leave the nursery while there's still stuff running in it. So what we do is we take advantage of that cancellation support, immediately cancel all the other stuff. Once everything's all cleaned up, then the exception is allowed to keep propagating into the parent there and all the way back up at the top of our program. So that's how this cancel thing works. Cancel exceptions raised here, comes out of the nursery, comes out of the proxy two way, eventually up to move on after. Right? Pretty straightforward. Um, there's other stuff in Trio. I'm going to skim over very briefly. So like I said, there's the, you've seen some of the networking APIs. You can sleep. You have signals, files, whatever. There's some stuff for inter-task coordination. I can show you that real briefly. So, um, so this is just a very simple example. Um, we're going to start three tasks down here, a sleeper and two waiters. And they all get object, access to this event object. So what the sleeper is going to do is like sleep for a little while, and then it wakes up. It's so excited about that. Think, this is like the child on Christmas morning example, right? It woke up. It wants everyone to know. It wants everyone else to wake up too. So it notifies them by setting this event. Like this, is, I woke up. That's the thing that happened. Now the waiters here go to sleep. They're waiting for the event to happen. And when it wakes up, then they print something so we can see what happened. We can run that, and you see they all go to sleep. Then after a little while, five seconds. Come on, there we go. 
sleeper woke up, and then they, they also wake up, right? So very simple, but gives you some of the tools you need to kind of coordinate activity between tasks. Um, we have some really lovely testing stuff I wish I could tell you more about, like um, magic clocks that let you te run timeout tests really quickly, stuff like that. Control C works. This is kind of sounds trivial, but it's the only Python concurrency library where this is true. Like it just does what you'd expect. We don't mention the docs, but <laughs> that's not true for anyone else. Um, we consider introspection monitoring to be sort of first class things. So there's like hooks to like see if your event loop's working right. Um, we help you with your docs. There's some prototype. Uh, compatibility layers, so you can use async IO libraries. Lots of cool stuff. Uh, though I should warn you that like this is still a young project. So sort of what I just told you is kind of what you get for right now. Um, this is you know trying to build build up this ecosystem. I'd love to have your help, but there is the question of like why would you come join me in doing this weird thing when there are these other libraries that have much more developed ecosystems? So that's what I'm going to try to convince you right now. Let's look, go back to that happy eyeballs example, right? Let's see what this looks like in Tria. Um, so to remind you, this is what we're trying to implement, right? This sort of diagram kind of encodes all of the logic that we're trying to do, right? And now, da, 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 if it will let me switch, there we go. Here we, okay, so I've, you can see I've prepared ahead of time. We have a function, it's gonna open a socket, we get the host name, the port, and the, a constant to be that timeout for how long do we wait before we get impatient and kick off the next thing, right? So how's this gonna look? Well, so we know obviously, first of all, we're gonna have to find out what are our possible places we could connect to. Um, there's a little, I'm gonna make this screen a little smaller, there we go. This is just get adder info gunk. So yeah, so remember I showed you get adder info before, this is Trio's version. If you can tell it's Trio, it says Trio dot in front and there's an await, otherwise it's the same thing. Um, so that's gonna give us a list of the possible connections we should try to make. Um, and then, Eventually, hopefully, one of them's gonna win, but maybe not, so we'll make a variable to hold it. And then we'll do some magic in here, and at the end, uh, we'll check. Okay, did someone actually succeed and make a winning socket? Uh, if not, well, okay, raise some error. Too bad. Otherwise, return that. Okay, now let's fill in this middle part. What, what are we gonna do here? So we know we're gonna have to run some things concurrently, right? All these different attempts. So each of those sort of vertical stripes is gonna have to be a different task. So we're gonna have to have a nursery. We're gonna have to have a function to run in that nursery and execute the attempt. So let's make this. So we have some attempt. And I guess it has to know which one it is, like which thing is this one supposed to target. So that'll be that. And maybe it'll need some more arguments. I don't know, we haven't figured that out yet. And then here's our standard incantation. With true, async with true.open nursery as nursery. And now we have a nursery, and we're gonna kick off that first attempt, right, as soon as we do. That'll be for the target zero, and maybe we'll need some more arguments, okay. Now, what does each of these attempts have to do? So, well, the first thing it does is have to wait has the, for the previous one to finish or the timeout to expire. So let's make a note of that. So first, wait for previous to fail or timeout. And then, what's it gonna do? Um, that's like right here, well, so that's, a, the next one has to start waiting there, so we should probably like start it at that point. Say, okay, now is your get going on the, with the waiting. <laughs> Hurry up and wait now, right? So the so start next attempt there, and then at that point, okay, we have to actually you know try connecting now the purple part. So you know, try connecting, and then there's two things that could happen, right? If it fails, tell the next about that. Right, because if it failed here, we want to let the next one know, okay, you're done waiting, you can move on, you can get going. Or if it succeeds, then we have to do two things. We want to, uh, uh, we want to cancel the others, right? We're like, forget about those, we're done, right? And return the working socket, right? Okay, so let's fill these in now. So how, we wanna wait for the previous attempt to fail or for a timeout to happen. Well, so we need to have some way to communicate between the tasks like has, which ones have failed, right? Um, so we're gonna, we'll use that trio.event thing I showed you. Uh, simplest thing, let's just say like attempts failed. We'll make a list, uh, just one for each entry in the, uh, for each of the possible targets. We'll make a separate event to mean that attempt has failed. And so now we're waiting for the previous one to fail, that means Await attempts failed, which minus one. 
dot wait, right? Except it's that or a timeout happens. Fortunately, it's easy to apply timeouts on arbitrary things in Trio, right? So we just say with Trio dot move on after timeout. And there, now that's one or the other. Except there's one more thing we have to watch out for, which is if which is zero, then that will become minus one, and that's like, that's not what we want, right? And we think, well, so what should we do there? Oh, well, so when which is zero, that's just the first attempt. That doesn't have to wait for anything, right? It should just move on. So we can just make this, let's make it a, if which is greater than zero, then we'll do this. Otherwise, we don't worry about it. Okay, so that's that part of the logic. Then we have to kick off the next attempt. Um, so again, well, so first of all, if there's, uh, if we're at the end, there's nothing else, to, nothing to kick off. So, uh, sorry, it's less than len. There we go. What? Okay. If there's something else to kick off, then we're going to have to start it. So that means nursery dot start soon. Tempt uh, the next one, and whatever arguments we need. Well, so ex actually, we've just, we've just realized we need another argument. We need to have the nursery object here, so we can do that. So we better pass that in too. Let's go through and update that, and then we'll pass it through here. And down here, we'll pass it into the first one, right? Make sense? And okay, that's it. That's gonna start the next attempt. So finally, we have to actually do the thing. So first, let's get the information out of about our particular attempt. So this is, I, hopefully you kind of remember that thing I showed you the getter where there, there's first three items, a gobbledygook, then the random empty string for no reason, and then the actual target. So that's what I'm just unpacking there with a little Python 3 tuple unpacking trick. And then, okay, this could fail, so we better use a try block. And so we make our socket, which is a trio.socket.socket. Dot socket. Say that three times fast. And we use our config there to configure it. And then we try to connect it. To that target that we were given, right? Okay, so it could fail. That's one possibility, which is it will give us an error. So what does that do? Okay, we have to tell the next one about that. So that's attempts failed. Dot set, right? Just set that event we said for this one, this attempt. It just failed, so we set it. Notify anyone who's interested. Otherwise, it might succeed. So that's like an else. If there's no error, else, uh, there's uh, we have to do two things. It says okay. Cancel the others. Well, so remember how I said in a nursery, when an exception comes out, it will stop and cancel the others. Every nursery has a little like move on scope inside it. Um, so we could have made one ourselves, but it's also we can just use that one because we want to cancel everything else in the same nursery. And so first we have the nursery, and it's just this cancel scope attribute. It's the one it uses. And then, like I said, if you want to just cancel it immediately, you just call the cancel method. So that does that, right? That implements this little gray box here where everything else gets cut off at that point. And then we need to return the working socket. So this is a little bit of awkwardness. We're trying to, we need to get it back out of this function into the parent function. And so we, we want to do is assign it to this winning socket variable. And because Python has funny scoping rules, we have to do is tell Python, no, really, that's, we mean that one. Not, we don't want to make a new variable called winning socket. We want to use the one that's already there. All right, and that's it. Oh, we better delete these dot, dot, dots then. I guess that's all we needed. And shall we, does that make sense? Anyone kind of follow that? Let's see if it works. Moment of truth. What do they actually call this? Open TCP socket. Important to look this up. Who should we connect to? <laughs> All right. <laughs> and let's print what it comes back with just so we can see what happened. And trio.run that. Ta-da! We got a connected socket. Okay, so it doesn't quite all fit on the screen at once, but hopefully, like I know that went fast, and I, it's okay if you don't like understand every detail there, but hopefully that basically made sense. That wasn't like any, I don't think I like pulled any rabbits out of my hat in the middle there, right? You can see that's a little under 40 lines of code, including the comments and everything. Um, and, also, and if we fixed the bug that they had in Twisted while we were on the way, right? And so this is kind of, this is the point, like, so like a little personal history here, right? Like I said, I did this, I like studied how these other libraries work and I came up with some like hypotheses about what were the problems in particular cases I'd run into. So can I come up with some principles to do, do that design, came up with these new primitives that China met those principles. But 
like, and then I ended up with, so I implemented, you know, these cancel scope, these nurseries, but I had, I had, these are like weird primitives. Like, I've never used this system. I've never written anything against them, right? This was one of the first things I tried to implement, right? Because it's just like, you know, well, if I'm going to make a concurrency library, I better have this, right? It's just a basic tool everyone needs. Um, and at first I was like, I have no idea how to even start, right? How do I use these? Like, my first intuitions about how to use, about what to do were like, you know, True was like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> That's not allowed. I don't support just spawning things. I don't support set a callback to be called later. Those just aren't, we only have two features, right? <laughs> but then, so I said, okay, fine. <laughs> stupid pro, stupid library I wrote. You only have two features. <laughs> so I guess there's not that many things to think about. Okay, wh what, what can I do? And I kind of tried to recreate that process here. I said, well, there's aren't that many things to try, right? So it's just kind of, what, what's the only thing I gotta do here? And I just worked through it, kept doing that. And then I was like, wait a second, this, I'm done. How, how am I done? <laughs> In less than 40 lines of code. And it's you know, okay. And I it's okay. Well, but it won't work. So I tried it and it crashed. Um, I had a typo and a variable name. Um, and I got a nice trace back because it like it worked because exceptions work, right? That's nice. Um, so I said, okay. So I fixed the typo and I tried it again. And that time it worked. And then I wrote a big test suite, just trying all sorts of exotic, like mocking time in the network to set up all kinds of wacky situations. And it, like, as far as I know, I just, it works, right? And like that, I mean, that's I think the magic of this line of the Zen, right? That like it's part you can easy to read is just like oh, uh, you know, yeah, like simple is better than complex. You know, you want things to be simple, and there's just one way to do it. But it's more than that, right? It's that if there's one obvious way to do it, it means that's why for you know, each problem you face in Python, you're like oh well, I don't have to think about what to do here. I just do the obvious thing, and I can keep worrying about my actual problems instead of spending time like trying to fight with the language. And that's what's like wait a second, that's kind of what we just did here. We took this problem, happy eyeballs implementation, that's like incredibly hard in the other systems. You know, Glyph spent years kind of like, ooh, and ended up with 600 lines of code trying to implement. And not only are we able to do that, and not only able to do it 15 times less code, we actually made it an obvious problem, right? It's not some like heroic thing. It's like, wow, suddenly I can fly, right? <laughs> so that's why I was like, okay, I think I'm on the right track here. I think I do need to keep pushing this forward. Start telling people about it. Hopefully, get them interested. Um, I do have to stop and briefly and think. A lot of this builds on a huge amount of work from other people over the last 20 years. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. But I also want to invite you all. You know, if you would also like to see if, if you can fly, if, uh, if you have that same experience, come and join us. We're friendly. There's a good manual. We can chat. There's lots of stuff. Uh, also, I have stickers. I should have put that on the slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come join us. We have stickers. Basically, that's what I got. Um, I'll leave that slide up if anyone has while well, we have questions or anything like that. But I hope you uh, hope you like it. <laughs> do we do questions or do we just yeah, move we on? We can or? do questions. Sure. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I'm used to academics. I mean, but these are the same people who like wanted me to demo my thing. Fair enough. They okay. put off yeah. that for my little demo. Yeah. No. So. Okay. Here you go. Uh, how would you compare uh, the Trio library to the native uh, Python async IO library, like the pros and cons, the differences in API design? So, yeah, so this is a big uh, a big topic of debate um, in certain circles. Uh, so, like Yuri, who was on the think slide there, is sort of the main uh, maintainer of async IO now, and we spent a lot of time chatting about, okay, is there any way we can make async IO better? Um, they're very different in the details. So, like. As I really thought, can I make this work as like on top of async IO or something? And it's just every single like there's just no nothing shared in the design basically, the way it ended up. Um, and part of that is that, um, well, it's basically my feeling about async IO is it did a really good job sort of with the tools available at the time. Um, if you don't have a sync await in particular, then it really makes it very hard to make a usable library. And they do a lot of tricks, including a lot of stuff that you know, was originally developed by like the Twisted project and so on, to make that as usable as possible. But then once you have a single weight, then you're like, wait a second, we have this giant pile of really complicated stuff to work around the lack of a single weight. Uh, do we actually need that anymore? Um, and if you think that a lot of the value here is the simplicity and the, OK, there's one obvious way to do that. Adding, like, async IO already has like three complicated ways to do everything. And then adding another one on top probably isn't the best plan. That isn't going to make things any simpler. Um, but 
I don't know. So there is some debate about how they how they can relate to each other. Basically, my feeling is that yeah, personally, I having tasted this, I cannot bear to go back to a sink IO. Um, I don't know if anyone here has used it seriously, but like it's just really hard to like make sure your program stops at the right time. Um, make sure that you don't like accidentally use infinite amounts of memory, like buffering things. Like it's just it's just all over the place. Like it's very difficult. Like so, the twisted stuff I showed you was using the same, basically the same APIs that async IO gives you, right? If you if you were doing it in async IO, it would look like the twisted code. Like that's sort of the basic. Maybe gives you some sense. So that's kind of where I am. That's why I'm doing this. Um, I, I there's there's an interesting email that I think might be Googleable, right? Where Guido even himself says that he can't defend async IO in the face of <laughs> newer approaches. Um, but give it a couple of years, Nathaniel, and then the standard lib will re-implement Trio too. Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll be an interesting PyCon this year. There'll be some interesting discussion. Um, I mean, okay. yeah, like I think it really pays for that complexity. So, like their big fancy new features they'll be coming in six months are things like uh, you can now tell when a stream is shut down, with a, and and wait to let your program till it happens. So you don't like just randomly lose data. Um, that's a new feature coming in three seven. Um, Start TLS, like the ability to turn on encryption partway through a connection, like you need for doing email or HTTP through a proxy. That's a new feature coming in 3.7. And it's not that they're like not smart people. It's just that it just takes, you know, these, these features are like hundreds of lines of code a piece because it's just really complicated to work with that, with those abstractions. Um, so these are features that Trio has, by the way, <laughs> for, you know, six months ago already. So. Good question, though. Yeah, yeah, that's a big question. Jared, I'll get to you in a second. Well, yeah. She's closer. <laughs> Just following up on that, what yeah. exactly is the performance difference between async IO and Trio? So, OK, like everything in performance, uh, like every performance question, the answer is it depends. Um, benchmarking is impossible. Um, so and basically, my philosophy towards that is that I want Trio to be sort of as fast as possible, but no faster. Um, sort of same as like Python, right? Like if we really wanted speed and that was the only thing we cared about, we'd be writing in some other language. We're willing to give up some speed for usability. If there's, when there's a conflict between usability and speed and true, I am willing to give up some speed. That said, in all the like benchmarks I've tried so far, um, it's basically on the same, it's competitive in general with other approaches. Um, and it's also like, and also I should say, I mean, all those benchmarks are meaningless because it's not like anyone's like written a large high traffic website on top of Trio yet. And that you know, and if you like, you can write like a little echo server and measure how fast it goes. But that's like a really misleading benchmark. Often, in fact, if you try and optimize that, it'll make you, often make things worse. Some of it. It's very hard to say, but basically, like it's reasonable as far as I can tell. We'll make it better if we have to. Uh, but I'm I'm not going to try and get into the game of like, haha, I am five percent faster on this micro benchmark. Therefore, you should all use it. I think that's a game we should all try to avoid getting into. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um... I'll definitely consider Trio going forward. Um, I was wondering, uh, what is there available today in terms of uh, application level libraries? So, Kafka, HTTP. Right, yes. Um, so, um, there's a, um, a library called Asks, which is someone's kind of attempt to re implement requests, um, which can run on Trio. Obviously, it is nowhere near as mature as actual requests. Um, you're asking about HTTP. Actually, do you want clients or servers? Do you want... uh, Client. Either. <laughs> either. OK, yeah. So that's the client side. Um, I am also uh, working on adding async support to requests. I've been talking to Kenneth about that. We have a sort of Skunkworks branch um, that I and some of the other Trio devs, uh, Quentin Pradet in particular, have been working on that. So we have a prototype version of URL lib 3, which is the library that request uses underneath, that can run on Python 2 synchronously. It can also run in Python 3 synchronously. It can also run in Python 3 on top of Trio or on top of Twisted. Um, so we're hoping that sort of will mature. That's kind of what we're trying to push ahead. Um, on the server side, um, I don't think there's anything. Like, I know there's people doing various experiments, but I don't think any of it's sort of like a public project you could download and use, really. Come join the chat channel, ask around. Someone might have something. Um, it's something that I'm hoping to work on soon. So I actually, another project of mine is this thing called H11, which is like an implementation of HTTP that's reusable and not backed by anything. So it actually makes it quite straightforward to implement things like a new server. Um, so I'm hoping to, I'll actually get to use the library I wrote at some point <laughs> to do some of that stuff. 
Um, and that basically, yeah, that is kind of give you, hopefully gives you a sense of where things are right now. Oh, and the other thing is we have this async IO compatibility layer that's sort of in prototype stage. Again, you know, you can come happy to chat with it. Uh, that's uh, Matthias uh, or Matthias something. <laughs> um, Smurfix on GitHub is working on that. Um, and, and so, and that, but it does seem to basically be working. It passes most of the async IO's own self test suite. Um, and so that, and, you know, hopefully within the next sort of few weeks, that'll reach the point where you can reasonably say, oh, yeah, you could just use AIO HTTP or whatever. It won't be quite as seamless if it was sort of a native library, but um, that, that will open up a lot of sort of those libraries for use. Another good question. All right, one more. Jared. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you can ask me later. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fine. Go ahead. Uh, the, it's very impressive some of the things you're doing here, especially with, like the cancellation stuff. Uh, I don't know how you're doing it. How much black magic are you using in this library? There's a certain amount of black magic. Um, there's one bit that uses C types to rearrange tracebacks in memory. Um, that's not that, though. Um, and I fixed 3.7, so we don't need to do that anymore. Um, <laughs> I mean, because basically, like, this, in some ways, this is, is somewhere halfway in between like, a new library versus a like, new extension to the language, right? Like, in other, other worlds, you know, Cancellation and nurseries would kind of just be like language features. You might you could you imagine them having syntax. That's not how Python's doing it, and it's actually quite nice because it means we can you know, iterate on this kind of thing. Uh, but so there is a certain amount of like clever stuff. Um, but that said, everything in Trio is just in pure Python. It's only a few thousand lines long. You can read it. The cancellation stuff in particular, I don't think there's any particular black magic. It's just sort of like we've got a little like a thread local stash that keeps track or you know for each task what cancel scopes are we inside of. So whenever you enter or exit one of those with blocks, it pushes and pops something. Excuse me. Um, and whenever you have a blocking operation, there's like a very low level uh, blocking operation called wait task rescheduled, which everything sort of eventually funnels down into. Um, and when that gets executed, one of the things you have to provide is, OK, and if you get canceled, how do we wake you up from this? Like, how do you like clean things up or whatever? And so there's a certain generic system that when a, when you, you, know, you call dot cancel on a cancel scope, it goes and ch checks the tasks and says, OK, they should all be woken up. They're asleep. And then every time you go to sleep, say, oh, have I been canceled since the last time I went to sleep? It's like, I mean, there's a, there's a fair amount of like bookkeeping, but that's kind of all there is to it, really. Uh, I mean, comparatively speaking, compared to like you know greenlit-based libraries and Twisted, oh, what I've you, seen of Twisted, uh, sorry, from what I've seen of Truro, it's very little black magic. But you don't get to flying without a little bit of magic. Yeah, yeah. we're trying to reduce the magic over time. but. I mean, everything works on PyPy even, so it can't be that much magic. Um, yeah, it's definitely not greenlit. <laughs> Greenlit's, I don't know. <laughs> you you talked to Armin Rigo about that too. Yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> all right, but yeah, yeah, that was a great talk. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Right. Thanks a lot.